Continuing our series of teams in the postseason, let's talk a little bit about the Twins and the Blue Jays. You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. I am an Emmy-nominated television producer who has been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now, and we are now in the fifth postseason as a member of the Locked On Podcast Network. You can follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter, or whatever it's called now, and on Instagram. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Thanks so much for making us your first listen every single day. And if you listen to us every single day, then please, please put a little hashtag that you are an everyday Sully. I just want to make sure that you, you're following us all year long, all the off season. We're going to have some fun. Um, let me tell you a little bit of what we're going to be doing today. We've continued. We, we, we're doing a little bit of each host of the Locked On uh, teams who are in the postseason are telling us our thoughts. I was, granted, as I said in uh, the previous episode, we're doing everything kind of a day late here, trying to get out hurting the cats of the Locked On hosts. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the Twins and the the Toronto Blue Jays. And let's just cap, recap a little bit of what happened today. Uh, the Minnesota Twins finally, finally, finally broke that that never-ending streak of postseason losses. I'm very, very happy for them. Uh, no fan base deserves to have a losing streak like this. The last time the Minnesota Twins won a postseason game was 2004, before the birth of my children. Both of my children are now in college. Um, and, and they've been in the postseason in 06, in 09, in 2010, in 2017, in 2019, in 2020, and all those years, doom, gone, including that wonderful 2016 that was filled with, you know, uh, you know superstars like, you know, uh, Joe Maurer, Justin Morneau, uh, uh, Tori Hunter, Johan Santana, Joe Nathan. I mean, that team was absolutely stacked and probably should have won the pennant that year. Nobody remembers them. Nobody, because they were three and out to the Oakland A's that year. So this year, they're going up against the Toronto Blue Jays, who went in with super, super high expectations because they were you know, they were a very good team in the regular season. But they also have you know, Bassett and Gosman and you say Kikuchi. And I mean, they had a super deep rotation that they had there and you started to see they were starting to hit they're starting to hit big time and so a lot of people were saying that they were a potential sleeper especially that i heard more than one person say hey they got the ideal situation because they got to get the twins who are only in the postseason that high ranking because of the fact that they're the american league central champions and boy, wouldn't you rather face the Twins than face the Tampa Bay Rays, who are a 90-some-odd win team, sometimes look like a championship-caliber team? Oh, boy, the Rangers got lucky in their seating. I, I, more than one person was saying that the, the Blue Jays got the got lucky because they pulled the Twins as a, as a seed. Now, if you remember, if you listen to the show, if you're an everyday Sully, I know that you did listen to the show, I said, be careful what you wish for. The Minnesota Twins actually finished with a record that was only a game or so behind Seattle and Houston and the Texas Rangers and the Toronto Blue Jays. It wasn't like this was an egregious division champion, that the division was so terrible and that the Twins were so terrible that they couldn't, you know, they were, uh, it's an insult that they're in the playoffs. And they had a very, very good final month of the season. Well, what happened today? Well, you know, it, uh, as it turns out, when the Twins had the number one overall pick um, a few years ago, when a certain fella 
by the name of Lewis. You remember Lewis? You remember Royce Lewis, who seemed to hit grand slams at will? Well, that number one overall pick hit a big home run in the first inning and a big home run in the third inning and gave the Minnesota Twins an early 3 nothing lead. And with that, the Twins did everything in their power to hold on. Now, the Blue Jays managed to get a few hits here and there. Uh, Bo Bichette got a couple, couple of hits. Uh, Vlad Guerrero Jr. got a double. But it was the Twins. Now, Lewis was, of course, the big hero. He got on base three times, drove in all three of the runs. Uh, Lopez pitched well. He didn't pitch great, but he pitched well. He pitched into the sixth inning, gave him some innings, let up five hits, and walked two. So it's seven base runners in fewer than six innings. That's not great, but he wiggled out of trouble. And then the parade of relievers, Varland, uh, Thalbar, Jazz, Duran, they shut down the Blue Jays' offense. And here we are for the first time since 2004. Since the, the last time the Blue Jays, I'm sorry, the last time the Twins won a postseason game, the curse of the Bambino was alive and well. And so um, Barrios, former twin, is going against Sonny Gray, who I don't think is a former Blue Jay, in the second game. All of the thoughts and all of the, hey, the, the Blue Jays have the right seed, they got the right hitters, they're getting all the right moments, they're going to wake up on Wednesday, realizing, wow, our season's on the line. It was a terrific showing for the Twins. And for something like this, look, at a lot can be said about uh, getting the proverbial monkeys off of people's backs as being maybe overrated. I don't think so. Because now nobody can mention that. And sometimes when you have a failure that has been compounding for so long, Removing the mention of it, even the players who have nothing to do with it. There's nobody left the 2014 or the 2006. They're not even playing the same damn stadium. They were playing in the freaking Metrodome back then. When you remove that, hey, is it, what do you feel? He never won since then. He never won since then. He never won since then. I saw it as a Red Sox fan growing up when they're asking players like Mike Greenwell and Rich Gedman and, and Dwight Evans, who had nothing to do with the 1918 season and going down asking the Mo Vaughns and the Nomar Garcia Paras, asking the Jason Varitex and the Trot Nixons of the world, what do you think about the curse of the Bambino? As if they were there in 1918 or 46 or 67 or 75 or 78 or 86 or 88 or 2003 or something were there in 2003. But they had nothing to do with each other. And once you remove that line of questioning, suddenly that that pressure is no longer on the team. Now you can never bring up that ever. It's gone. Get a cab. Never can mention it again in regards to the Minnesota Twins. They have won a playoff game since 2004. You don't ask that question anymore. And if they win one of the next two games, they get to move on. Now, Toronto still has the talent to do it. Still has the talent to win. They can easily win this game tomorrow, and then it's a do-or-die game. It becomes the definition of a coin toss. That's a coin toss, by the way. So, the lesson is be careful what you wish for. If you say, oh, I hope we get the twins, be careful what you wish for. Because I'm sure a lot of people thought that getting the twins was the ideal chef's kiss in terms of what the Blue Jays wanted. Well, they got it. And now they're facing elimination. When we come back, we're going to talk, we're going to have uh, Brandon Warren, who is the host of Locked on Twins, tell us a little bit and this was recorded to be fair recorded before the uh the game that took place t this afternoon but we're going to hear some of his thoughts about the twins their expectations at the beginning of the year and well some thoughts about the team in general as we go into the postseason how dare they so look at Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. 
The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. Hey everyone, Brandon Warren here from Locked On Twins coming at you with some playoff questions that we're going to try to get answered about your Twins this October. Number one, expectations for the team heading into the season versus the expectations for the team heading into the playoffs. Now, I think what's important to note is that getting to the top of the AL Central and what that was like this year Um, I think that expectation is a lot different than trying to make something happen in October because it's not going to be as battle tested perhaps as some of the other teams from divisional play. Now, with that said, the different balance of the schedule and the fact that it's October, so anything can happen because the series are so short means that I'm, I'm really more just looking for the twins to finally, finally end this 0 and 18 playoff streak, getting back to 2004 first year in college. So my expectations were that the Twins could contend coming into the season. They did as I had hoped, maybe not in the path that I had hoped, but they did as I had hoped and got here. And now it's time to take those expectations up a notch. Just being here is not enough to win. They need to move on and show that they're more than just a one-up. Secondly, Which batters are coming into the playoffs hot at the plate? For the Twins, there are a lot of hitters who are really swinging it well. Royce Lewis, before he got hurt, had an OPS of 1,022 in September. Matt Wallner, Willie Castro, you name it. Ryan Jeffers has been swinging it well. Max Kepler's entire second half has been a huge revelation. The Twins, on the whole, had an 825 OPS in September. So the offense, in general, swung it pretty good coming into the playoffs. And that wasn't the case to start the season. If you break down the offense's statistics month by month, you will see a definite uptick into the second half and beyond because the offense was just dreadful to start the season and really picked things up as the season went on, which I think is about all you could ask for. The depth of your team starting rotation, explain it. So for the Twins, where they're going to be good is that they've had rotation depth all season long but they'll tap into it a little differently in October. So Pablo Lopez will start game one. Sonny Gray will start game two. That's about as good of a one-two as you could hope for. I mean, certainly there are probably other teams who like theirs better, but it's enough to win in October. Beyond that, Joe Ryan has had moments where he's been just nasty this year and moments where he's given up homers left and right, although while battling a groin injury. But for him as the number three starter, and then you've got Bailey Ober in that mix, Kent and Maeda, both who have started and had good seasons, but Maeda has bullpen experience. I think the fact that they're going to be strong at the top of the rotation will let the bullpen kind of filter more guys in for those kind of long relief type outings that we see so much in October. So I think the Twins have a deep enough starting rotation, but in October, when you think about do you have top of the rotation help, the Twins can kind of claim both of those things. So I think the Twins are in a good spot rotation-wise. Why is your team's bullpen depth good enough to win the World Series? So the Twins made one addition at the deadline, and it was Dylan Floro. And they flipped him for Jorge Lopez. Lopez went to the Marlins. Twins got Floro. The Twins just DFA'd Floro earlier this week um, or late in the season here. Uh, So they did not make any changes to their bullpen for the most part at the deadline. But... Moving Louis Varlin to the bullpen has been huge for them. Brock Stewart has come back off the injured list and looked really good. Chris Paddock coming back from Tommy John surgery throwing 98. That's a few guys you can really throw into that bullpen where Emilio Pagan has pitched really well this season, especially related to last season. Griffin Jacks has his moments. And then Juwan Duran, uh, when he's right, is one of the best relievers in baseball, closers, whatever you want to call him. They have enough late inning help and then enough guys who can soak up innings in bigger kind of roles in the middle of games, which you see a lot in the postseason. So Varland will do that. Maybe Bailey Ober, Kent Maeda. The Twins are coming in with a really nice multi-pronged, multi-faceted approach to pitching that is uh, is unlike anything I think we've ever seen from the Twins in this era um, and making the playoffs. So it is pretty exciting, and I think they're in a good spot 
overall pitching wise. What is your team's greatest strength? Um, honestly, for the Twins, I think their best strength is still going to be starting pitching because it has been for much of the season. But it's not as though the offense and bullpen are complete zeros. And, you know, the Twins made the postseason in 2019. It was homers, 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 but they had no pitching healthy and were no match for the Yankees. In this case, against the Blue Jays, when they'll be hosting every game in this series, uh, they're just they're in so much a better spot starting pitching wise. And then it just, like I said, filters backwards. From there, your bullpen gets so much better with guys who are are backfilled uh, from the rotation. What about your team are you worried about in the playoffs? It's the Minnesota Twins in the playoffs. There's only worry to be had. The Twins are 0-18 right now in the postseason since winning a playoff game that Johan Santana started back in 2004. Many of our listeners were not even born yet. Many of our listeners may have been in school, like elementary school. I, for one, was first year college, right out of high school, and um, it's been too long. So the fear is that this streak continues. Other than that, though, I mean, they've had injuries. Carlos Correa, Byron Buxton, and Royce Lewis all having some form of issue right now coming into this series should scare most fans. Now, with that said, young players have stepped up. They have depth and all that. But if you're going to be scared of anything, the streak and the fact that some of the big guys are not super healthy would probably be at the top of my list. But besides that, if you can't get excited about playoff baseball because you're afraid you might lose, it's the wrong attitude to have. And I'm afraid that's what a lot of us in Minnesota have. This team has what it takes to win the pennant, the AL pennant. They have older veteran guys who've been in those situations and they're not the superstars. Kent Maeda, Kyle Farmer, Donovan Solano have all played different places, bigger spots. They're going to be ready for these moments and they're going to be ready to help guys like Edouard Julien, Matt Walner, and other youngsters in those moments. The pitching staff is set up actually much better than I would have ever expected coming out of the trade deadline. They've made the bullpen over and in September had the number one strikeout rate in rate, excuse me, in baseball with Tampa Bay. The pitching is where it needs to be. The hitting is where it needs to be. The Twins are where they need to be in terms of home field advantage for this series. The Blue Jays are coming in having fought their asses off to get here. Meanwhile, the Twins have been able to basically play games at kind of a leisurely pace, get some guys some work here and there, and that sort of thing. All the arrows should point at the Twins here. They absolutely should for this series. And then moving forward, who's there to be afraid of? The AL has been topsy-turvy all season long. Nobody could touch the Rays to start the season. The Astros have had moments, but also not as good as they've been in the past. What is Texas going to look like? You know, it's there's no team in the AL to fear, and that's why I think the Twins are going to win the AL pennant. Write it down, bookmark it, quote, tweet, dunk on me, whatever it takes, but the Twins are going to win the AL pennant. Thank you, Brandon Ward. And, you know, you said, what is there to worry about the Minnesota Twins in the playoffs? And you said, well, it's the Minnesota Twins. There's only worry to be had. I guarantee you, Brandon Ward is a little more relaxed right now and a little more, I don't know, possibly optimistic about what the Twins can possibly do. Well, when we come back, we're going to have Sean Woodley, who is coming in f- to talk a little bit about his beloved Toronto Blue Jays. But first, I'm going to talk about some pants. Now, let me tell you something. Bird dogs, that's the way to go. Bird dogs are pants that make you feel good. They're fantastic. They have bird dog stretched khaki shorts that are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. And bird dogs do the exact same thing as Lululemons, but they fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of stiff, restricting cotton. Bird dogs fix that issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks like khaki, but stretches to give you a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird Dogs uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. And Bird Dogs are functional for any occasion. Golf, going on a date, going for evening with your friends, 
going to the pool, go to work out, going to work, just lounging around. What you need to do is you need to go to birddog.com slash locked on MLB or enter promo code locked on MLB at checkout for a free bird dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddog.com slash locked on MLB for a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. You won't. We promise you. Sean Willie here from Locked On Blue Jays to detail everything you need to know about the Toronto Blue Jays heading into the 2023 MLB postseason. Question number one, what were the expectations for the Blue Jays coming into this season and what are they now that the playoffs are set to begin? Really, this has been a moving target all season long. At the very start of the season, the expectations were sky high, win the division high, flirt with 100 wins high, and it just did not work out that way for this team, despite some offseason moves that seemed to put them in a position to better contend for a division title. As the Rays and Orioles ran away early on, the Jays really struggled with scoring runners with runners in scoring position. It was just a nightmare for this team hitting in clutch spots, and they lost a lot of very close games as a result of that in the middle part of the season. And if you talk to me in July, I don't think any Jays fans had very high expectations for what this team could do, as it was kind of a mess of a season. They, of course, have scraped in. They finished pretty strong. And now that the playoffs begin, all the stuff that they do very well, pitching, defense, base running, that's the stuff that tends to play once you get into October. And so the expectations are clearly to beat the Minnesota Twins in the first round, despite being on the road for this series. And beyond that, I feel like anything less than an ALCS appearance will feel quite disappointing when you consider what the lofty preseason goals for this team were. Which batters are coming into the playoffs hot at the plate? Number one is Brandon Belt. He has been just awesome for the Jays in his first season in Toronto. And he came back from the injured list in the final week of the season with three home runs in the final handful of games. He is in great form and has been mashing right-handed pitching all season long. It has the best OPS plus of any member of the Toronto Blue Jays. Yes, he's sheltered from going up against lefties, but guess what? Sonny Gray, Pablo Lopez, who the Jays will see to start off the playoffs, both righties, both liable to be mashed by Brandon Belt. Kevin Biggio has also been a huge story for the Jays as he's gone from being someone in the middle of the season who thought maybe this guy doesn't belong on the roster anymore He's now become a vital utility player for this team and had a 112 OPS plus over the course of September. He's been very solid filling in for injured players like Bo Bichette, and he's absolutely part of the big plans going into this season, into this postseason, that is, for the Blue Jays. Explain the depth of your team's starting rotation. This is where the Blue Jays really shine. It's not just that the Blue Jays have incredible starting pitchers. It's that they have very different starting pitchers. Kevin Gosman has been an absolute ace all season long. If not for Garrett Cole, he'd be very much in contention to win the Cy Young for, frankly, the second straight season justifiably. Kevin Gosman rocks. He comes out with this fastball splitter combination that leaves other hitters baffled more often than not. He finished third in the majors in war for pitchers as well, per fan graphs. He's been great, and he is someone you can set your watch to if you're the Blue Jays. Following that, you have Chris Bassett, who comes in, not throwing very hard, but he throws six or seven pitches that he mixes beautifully all over the place. He should get the start, one would think, for game two, and he has been rock solid for the Jays. A couple of blow-up outings here and there, and he might actually have a ERA south of three, if not for a couple of those tough starts, including his very first start of the season in St. Louis. After that, it's Jose Barrios, who's been a resurgent man this year. Last season was really rough. Barrios was arguably the worst regularly used starting pitcher in all of baseball. This season, he's back to the consistent ways that he found in Minnesota and in his first season in Toronto after getting traded to them in the middle of the season. He was great this season, ERA under four, very reliable, a perfectly cromulent third starter. And then following that up has been Yusei Kikuchi, who's been awesome himself, coming from the left side, he throws very hard, and he's just left other teams with a lot of questions unanswered when 
It comes to how to solve Yusei Kikuchi. He was very volatile last year as well. Didn't seem like he really had a place in this rotation, but the Jays coaching staff has really figured things out with Yusei Kikuchi, and he himself has figured it out. He's a great fourth option for the Jays to have. And that doesn't even mention Hyunjin Ryu, who has been really fun and actually quite useful for the Jays since coming back from Tommy John surgery. And of course, the big elephant in the room is Alec Manoa, the opening day starter for the Blue Jays, who won't even be on the playoff roster and has been shut down for the season after a nightmare campaign. This is a deep team with starting pitching, and they could actually be deeper, which is kind of crazy. Why is the Jays' bullpen good enough to win the World Series? This is really the thing that I think differentiates the Jays from previous versions of this team, dating back all the way to 2015. You think of some of the best teams in the playoffs, and they sport these really deep bullpens with scary dudes coming out time after time, and now this team actually has that. Jordan Romano has been one of the best closers in baseball for a couple of seasons, ERA under three. Yeah, he's liable once in a while to have a bit of a rough outing, get in some trouble, get some guys on the base pass, but he has been awesome shutting games down for the Jays all year. Jordan Hicks was a massive addition at the deadline. Having a dude who can throw 102 regularly is just a really nice thing to have and a pretty fun thing to watch if you're a Blue Jays fan. Beyond that, Eric Swanson with his outstanding splitter has been fantastic. Yes, it's a bit of a bummer. He had to be acquired in exchange for Teoscar Hernandez, who the Jays could really use on offense right now. But Eric Swanson's been a great setup man, seventh inning guy for the Jays. You'd figure he's going to continue over that role. Tim Meza has maybe been the most reliable bullpen arm for the Jays all season long. An ERA well under two coming from the left side. He's really tough to figure out. Doesn't allow very much hard contact whatsoever. And then beyond those four, you have Jimmy Garcia. You have Trevor Richards, who for much of this season was excellent. It might not actually get any playoff run because he's been very, very bad of late. But you also have Jay Jackson, potentially even Nate Pearson mixing in. This is a team that has a ton of solid arms coming out of the pen. And Henesis Cabrera is another bit of a wild card guy who came over from St. Louis at the deadline, was not a very good at all in, in his St. Louis tenure, but has been rock solid for the Jays from the left side coming out of the pen as well. This team is loaded with bullpen arms. What is the Jays' greatest strength? And look, I've gone through the pitching. The starting pitching is fantastic. The bullpen is rock solid and very deep. But this team, to me, its strength is in not making stupid mistakes. This is a very sound defensive team. And that's what happens when you have Kevin Kiermeyer in center field most days, Dalton Varsho in left field filling in in center when you don't have Kevin Kiermeyer in center. You've got Bo Bichette, who's made massive strides as a shortstop defender. And Matt Chapman, despite a tough year at the plate after a rock-solid April, has been one of the best third baseman defenders in all of the majors for years now. You couple that with some really good catching defense. Danny Jansen is not available for the Jays right now, but Alejandro Kirk, in kind of a surprising fashion, has been a rock-solid defender as well. So this team just doesn't make mistakes on the defensive end, and we've seen time and time again in the playoffs, all it takes is one miscue, and it can cost you. The Jays are not going to beat themselves in the playoffs this time around. What is your biggest worry about the team going into the playoffs? And strangely enough, it's the big best players on the team in the batting order. And in particular, you start with Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who's been pretty good. As all told, he's been a well above average hitter this season, but he's not been Vlad, capital V, who you expect to see. Just 26 home runs this year after 32 and 48, where he led the majors two seasons ago. Just not been Vlad's year. A lot of ground balls, a lot of really hard ground balls and long stretches of just not offering a whole lot of production tough spots in running with runners in scoring positions where he's just not been able to come through he of course is still vladimir guerrero jr so anytime he runs into one you just kind of think oh he's back he's he's vlad everything's okay but an under 800 ops for vlad this season not what you want to see he's going to be a huge huge piece of whatever the jays do in the place in the playoffs whether it's good or bad if he's hitting the jays are very difficult to beat and how far in the postseason will this team go? I think they have the juice to beat the Minnesota Twins. I'm not terribly concerned. Yes, the Twins have a great rotation, but the Jays arguably have a greater one. And the Twins all season long have been a very bad defensive team. Of course, things can go weird in small samples like a three-game series. But the Jays, I think on the whole, are the better team. They've played in the way more challenging division all season as well. And I think they will have what it takes to beat the, the Twins in the first round. Beyond that... It's anybody's guess. I think this team probably has the talent where they should fancy themselves a World Series contender. The American League, while it is, of course, loaded with the Orioles and the Rays and the Astros, 
I don't think any of these teams are unbeatable. The Rays are super injured right now. The Orioles are very untested. And the Astros have not been fantastic all season long. I think there's every chance the Blue Jays get themselves on a magical Philadelphia-style run because of their pitching and defense. I'll say ALCS is my official prediction, but would not be shocked at whatever happens. They could lose in the first round. They could make it to the World Series. It would be very fitting of this baseball team to do whatever you think is the least likely thing as they have been wildly unpredictable super maddening and very irritating to watch all season long well that was sean woodley talking from locked on blue jays and you know sean i get it in terms of your thoughts about the bats possibly lighting up and that's going to be the way to go if vlad guerrero jr really gets on fire well then the blue jays are going to have a pretty good shot to tie this series with the minnesota twins but it's all right now resting on the arm of Mr. Barrios going into it. And maybe the bats will catch up and light, you know, catch on fire. I don't know. Neither do you. But we're going to find out real, real soon. Well, look at game two is tomorrow. We're already seeing some excitement and the twins flipping the script and getting that monkey off of their back. Uh, all today, you're going to see the shows where we talk about the the diamondbacks versus the brewers the phillies versus the marlins this show obviously twins blue jays and the rangers rays show so we're going to have all of those series captured and the next day we'll talk a little bit about the dodgers braves orioles and astros we're at home filing their nails waiting for the end of it so follow us at locked on mlb pods on twitter and instagram and be sure to follow brandon warren at locked on twins sean woodley at locked on blue jays and follow us, follow me. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Talking about the Twins and the Blue Jays and how history has already started to turn. This has been Locked On MLB for the third day of October 2023. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. <laughs>